Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So today I'm going to be talking about my January wrap up. Because I read a lot of different things in January. Some graphic novels, some romance, a thriller. We we're just all over the place to start the year. Um, and to be honest, we're going to do this quick and dirty because I'm filming this during my lunch break. So let's get into it. So I thought I'd talk about the books in order of what I rated lowest to what I rated highest. And I'm actually going to start with one that I did not rate at all because it's more of a coffee table book. And that is Literary Witches by... Oh no. I didn't look up how to say her name. I'm going to guess Tesea Kitaskaya, illustrated by Katie Horan. So the proper pronunciation of the author and illustrator's names are Tysia Kataiskaya and Katie Horan. Somehow I was zero for two on that one, and I apologize to all involved. Like I said, the reason I didn't really rate this is because it's more of a coffee table book, but since I bought it, I did want to, you know, give it a read through. This is a, a compilation of different female writers and authors from all around the world, spanning from like ancient Greece, Sappho, to present day. Toni Morrison, people like that. And the illustrations, my god, absolutely beautiful. This book just kind of gives a fantastical look at these women writers and describes, you know, if they were witches, what would their vibes be? What would their powers be? Um, the most interesting part of the book for me is it did have a little recommended reading section at the bottom of, of every page about a female writer. And I'll definitely be referencing this in the future and those recommended reading lists so I can broaden my horizons and pick up some books from authors I might have never heard of before, but which are obviously, you know, well-loved classics and very important works of literature. So that was Literary Witches. And again, I did not rate this one. Next up is The Clockmaker's Daughter by Kate Morton. So this is a book that follows a full cast of characters that inhabit this old English manor and kind of follows the different pieces of their lives as they live there, as they move away, etc. You mostly follow um, a Victorian 1860s timeline along with a present day timeline, but again there are a lot of other time periods interspersed between there. I would say it's chock full of romance, legends, Victorian secrets, Victorian ghosts. It really did revolve around the manner that brought all these characters together and how we are all connected through time by place and also by loss. Unfortunately I ended up rating this three stars because it just didn't do it for me. I was looking for something with a bit more action, a bit more mystery, and this just didn't check those boxes for me. But if you are looking for something that's Victorian, ghostly, vibes only, definitely check this one out. So yeah, I ended up rating this one three stars. The next book I picked up was Radioactive by Lauren Redness. This is a graphic novel about the lives of Marie and Pierre Curie. Something about this graphic novel is it had the most interesting and surreal art style I think I've ever seen from a graphic novel. Um, you've got pictures interspersed with some really um, interesting drawings. And I think this more modern avant-garde art style was a really interesting and good choice for this story because Marie and Pierre were doing groundbreaking research, just making some of the biggest discoveries in modern science, and I think this art style played really well with that. Something else that I thought was really incredibly done was this book really showed the contrast between Marie and Pierre's domestic life, their brilliant scientific discoveries, but also the horrors that their their research into radiation would unleash in the coming years, particularly with the invention of the atomic bomb. On the whole, I rated this 3.5 stars just because um, I'm not a big science nonfiction girly. I just picked this one up because I happened to see it at the library. Again, it wasn't quite my thing, but it was also super, super interesting. So if you're looking for um, a graphic novel about science, definitely check this one out. Next up we have The Night Swim by Megan Golden. Always nice to read from a fellow Megan. This is a thriller mystery, I don't know quite how to describe it, that follows a woman that runs a podcast about true crime and this season of the podcast she's specifically looking into a rape trial in a small beach town where the you know golden son of the town who has a swimming scholarship and everything is accused of raping a teenage girl and she is reporting on the trial as it unfolds and also 
giving the facts of the case so the reader can decide if they think um, this boy is guilty or not guilty. There's an added layer of mystery. When this podcast woman comes into town, someone else starts to seek out her help for a different mystery that happened about a decade ago and asking for her help to solve that one as well. I definitely think this one had a very interesting premise. It had some great like non-supernatural, spooky, creepy vibes. The beach town, small town setting was excellent. Also the fact that there are kind of dual mysteries going on at the same time um, I think was a really smart addition, so you're never bored. Overall, I gave this one four stars. I thought it was an excellent thriller, um, but maybe not one that I'll return to or think about a lot in the future. It was just a good time while I was reading it and time to move on the next kind of thing. Next up is Rich People Problems by Kevin Kwan. Honestly, I'm so proud that I read this because I think I started the series in 2019, so it was high time that I finish it. This is the third book in the Crazy Rich Asian series, and we kind of pick up where we left off in book two. We're following Nick and Rachel and their families and some other people in their social circle as they get up to some pretty ridiculous, expensive shenanigans. This one specifically focuses on the fact that Nick's grandma, who we met in the first one, is on her deathbed. And being a rich and powerful lady, that causes a lot of drama. People are trying to get to her inheritance. Every family member shows up trying to vie for this fortune. I really loved the direction the sequel went in. I thought it was really well paced. There was just enough drama without going too over the top, which I think um, the second book fell victim to a little bit. And overall, I gave this one four stars. It was a really fun read, and I was so glad I could finish this series off on a high note. I also read Eating Fire by Margaret Atwood this month. This is a collection of her poetry from 1965 to 1995. As you can see, I have very well tabbed all my favorite lines, my favorite poems. Um, this was a reread as well as a new read for me. Let me explain. Um, originally this was three different collections of poetry and I read them that way and then I found out that it had been compiled into one book and I just had to have it so I could uh, mark and tab it up for myself. Margaret Atwood is a very special poet for me because I chose her to write a 10-page poetry paper on senior of high school. What originally drew me to her was the fact that she writes a lot of poems about women and the female experience, and also blending that with mythology, particularly Greek mythology, which I absolutely love. Yes, I was a Percy Jackson kid, if you can tell. Overall, I gave this one four and a half stars. It definitely wasn't a perfect poetry collection to me. There were a lot of poems that went over my head, so and that's definitely my bad for not understanding them. I just didn't have the brain cells to comprehend them, but the ones that did really slapped. Um, Margaret Atwood knows how to write a line that will just, you know, pierce your heart, tear you in half, go for broke. And she also has this style of writing that's kind of unexpected. It's very sarcastic, venomous. It's sad at times. It's angry at times. I think she plays with the idea of not being the poet, not being the woman the world expects her to be, which is very compelling, to be honest. Also, I don't want to build this up to be like the greatest feminist poetry of all time through the lens that this does delve into women's experiences that the world doesn't acknowledge a lot. It is a work of feminist poetry from that perspective. I know Margaret Atwood doesn't really define herself as a feminist and if anything these poems would be classified as very like white feminism I think. If I could recommend one poem specifically from this book, if you want to check out Margaret Atwood's poetry, I would recommend Helen of Troy does counter dancing. I think that's what it's called. <laughs> hold on, hold on. We're uh, we're fact checking here, people. Okay, found it. I think you can find it on the internet. It's a pretty short poem, but uh, really packs a punch. And it's about Helen of Troy, if she were a stripper in modern day. I mean, what more do I need to say? So again, not a perfect poetry collection. I think there are definitely some criticisms against Margaret Atwood that are very valid, but this has a special place in my heart, again, from when I wrote about this in high school. And overall, I think it's worth the read. So four and a half stars for me. All right, now for my five star reads of January. I had three of them, which was super exciting. Um, the first two, I will present them together, are books three and four of Heartstopper, which, 
I think it's um, integral to my personality at this point that I love Nick and Charlie. I am obsessed with them. I am obsessed with Heartstopper. Book number three was a reread for me. And then book number four, because it was just released in the US, was brand new to me. Both obviously five stars. In book three, we follow their school trip to Paris and the fun stuff they and their friend group get up to. It also chronicles some emerging mental health concerns for Charlie. I think Alice Oseman handles these topics really well and they're very accessible and relatable for the YA audience this is meant for. And then for book four, Nick and Charlie are back. They're starting a new school year. We also dive more deeply into Charlie's mental health that was introduced in the last book. Um, how Nick can support Charlie and be there for him through these. Um, ups and downs in his life. It was so sweet. I feel like Charlie and Nick are growing up in front of my eyes and it made me so emo. And I just love these boys so much. Again, five stars, five stars all around. Cannot wait for volume five. Yes, volume five have to be announced, released in the US. Would love to know what the cover looks like. I just can't wait. I love this series so much. And last, but very certainly not least was On the Come Up by Angie Thomas. This I think was my favorite book I read in January. Obviously there was some tough competition with the Heartstopper series, but overall no one is doing it like Angie Thomas. No one is writing YA like Angie Thomas and I am absolutely obsessed. This follows Brie who is an aspiring hip hop artist. She's also the daughter of a underground hip hop legend who was unfortunately killed very young. We get to follow her story as she tries to break into the music industry, but also she's still 16, so we follow her day-to-day -day life in high school as well. She's also a black student in a majority white high school and you get to see the difficulties that causes students like her. And when I say no one is doing it like Angie Thomas, I mean the way she's weaving together all these I mean, really interesting themes like exploitation of children in the music industry, racial profiling, social inequality that makes it essentially impossible for some people to escape poverty, adultification of black children, cycles of violence in communities, and then more traditionally YA, less serious things like first love, high school difficulties, chasing your dreams, and it just came together perfectly. I really recommend the audiobook for this one because you can hear someone that actually knows how to rap, rap Breeze lyrics, because let me just tell you, I ain't no rapper. <laughs> so it was wonderful to be able to hear that and experience it through the audiobook. I absolutely recommend this book wholeheartedly. And again, a well-deserved five stars. I also just realized every time I hold up a book, you can see my single purple fake nail that I have on. No, this is not a Coke nail. I'm just trying out the Olive and June press on nails. And I just wanted to try out one to see how long it would stick before committing to the full set. So that's what that is. <laughs> so thank you for joining me on this little January wrap up journey. I will not be putting out a January TV, January, good Lord. <laughs> I will not be putting out a February TBR video because my February TBR essentially exists of uh, one book. Hold on. It's a little life. I'm trying to read A Little Life in February. I have it broken down into the tiniest sections possible because this book is incredibly intimidating for me, both um, size-wise and I'm afraid it's going to scar me emotionally. Um, but yeah, no use making a video that would be one book long. I do not care what else I read in February as long as I finish this hefty boy. So those were the nine books I read in January. I'm really happy with that number considering in 2021 I think I read like three books in January. It was a really rough start to the year. So we're starting off very strong in 2022 by comparison. Definitely leave a comment down below of what your favorite book you read in January was. I would love to hear your recommendations. And thank you guys for watching. Happy February. I hope you guys have a great month and I will talk to you all very soon.